Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction and for, for inviting me to this uh, seminar. So uh, indeed today I'm going to talk uh, about uh, canonical notions of forcing yeah, in reverse mathematics. So, but earlier today, I, uh, I was worried that my talk were not uh, self-contained enough and, and uh, not for a sufficiently general audience. So I think I overreacted a little bit and added very basic slides at the start to, to, to fix the notation about complexity theory. And so, Let's see. But so the issue is that uh, it will be way too fast if you don't already know complete theory. It would be way too slow if you already know it, and it still won't make uh, the slides self-contained. So, but so let's go quickly through it so that it will fix the notation. So first of all, uh, for me, uh, a set of integers is the same as an infinite binary sequence, which is again the same as a real number. So it's all the same from the viewpoint of complete theory. And uh, we say that a set of integers is computable if you just have a computer program in your preferred comp so programming language, which on an input n uh, decides whether n belongs to a or not. And it can be relativized in the sense that you can enrich your programming language with, uh, with uh, the characteristic function of any other set so that uh, uh, now you can compute a with the help of b uh, seen as an oracle. And so this defines uh, a pre-order, so a, re a reduction from A to B, which is called a Turing reduction. So we say that A is computable in B. And uh, so the Turing reduction is only a pre-order on the sets. And so you can make the standard uh, modification to make it a partial order by using the appropriate uh, equivalence relation. So we say that two sets are Turing equivalent if they are mutually reducible. And then this defines the notion of Turing degree, which is just the, the equivalence class associated to the set. And so the Turing degrees form a partial order, uh, partially ordered by the Turing reduction. And so uh, one of big parts of compatibility theory is to understand the structure of, of the Turing degrees. And so really we have to think of the Turing degrees are uh, computational powers in the sense that uh, it's a much better notion to consider when we want to talk about computation rather than sets, because uh, sets can, like, uh, you can have a lot of representations of the same mathematical objects uh, in terms of sets of integers. But if we make reasonable uh, representation, then they will belong to the same Turing degree. And so Turing degrees are much more robust for, for interpreting the notion of computational power. In particular, they are closed under uh, finite modifications and, and any, any computable transformation which preserves the information will, will yield something in the same Turing degree. So just to fix the notation, so uh, we can enumerate all the programs and uh, through enumeration phi 0, phi 1, phi 2, and so on. And so I write phi e of, uh, x hat, so if the if program has on input x, and we can also ask whether it has uh, before less uh, steps of t less than t steps of computation. So we write it uh, phi e of x uh, bracket t hat, just to say that we bound the, the 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 time before it has to halt. And then it relativizes. So we we just add the oracle uh, oh. as a upper uh, index. If uh, if we enrich the programming language with uh, A as an oracle, okay. so then we have one of the most basic results in complexity theory is the undecidability of the halting set. So there is no computer program which, given some index E, decides whether the ETH program has or its own input. So and as many operations on the set. Uh, it induces an operation on the Turing degrees, and so which is called the, the, the Turing jump. So given a set uh, A, we can define the halting set relative to A, which is just that indices so that you halt with the help of Oracle A on your own input. And this yields something of strictly stronger Turing degree. So it's, it yields an operation of the degrees, which builds a degree strictly stronger, which is kind of kind of successor or whatever. And so one last thing I want to talk before going to the heart of the subject is uh, just the arithmetic hierarchy. So we can um, 
we can classify uh, formulas about uh, about arithmetic uh, in terms of the alternation of quantifiers and actually this is a relevant uh, classification in terms of computation so we say that a formula is sigma zero n if you have n alternation of quantifiers starting with an existential one and at the end you have so there are variations of that which is the same notion and the same hierarchy so we can say r to be a computable predicate or to be uh, a formula of of arithmetic uh, with only bounded quantifiers or, or whatever and you are pi zero n if you have the same number of alternations but you start with a universal quantifier and you are delta zero n if you can be uh, defined by both a sigma zero n and a pi zero n formula and uh, one of the very nice thing about computability theory is the correspondence between computability and definability so in particular, a set is computably enumerable if and only if it is definable by a sigma zero one formula, and it is computable if and only if it is uh, definable by a delta zero one predicate. So, and, and it relativizes well in terms of, uh, uh, so you can go, you can iterate the Turing jump to the nth, uh, to the nth jump, and you are uh, computable in the nth jump if and only if you are delta zero n plus one. So. So we have really this correspondence and, and it goes way beyond uh, this, uh, the arithmetic hierarchy. Okay, so let's go to the heart of the subject. One of the, the, the main uh, questions I had in, in complete theory is uh, when, when we work on, on the subject is how we found the right techniques. And so what do we mean by do we have found the right techniques? So one way of interpreting it would be to say if aliens were studying the same uh, the same subject and working on the same questions would they come up with the same proof another way of interpreting it would be uh, do we lose in generality when we uh, use one technique in the sense that um, uh, are there some properties about the object we are building which uh, we wouldn't be able to prove uh, by this technique, because we, we make a degenerate uh, such object. So let's just try to exemplify a little bit this. So oh. a very simple and, and informal example is about uh, weak one genericity. So a set of binary, binary strings is dense if uh, for every string you can find an extension of it uh, belonging uh, to the set. And uh, an infinite binary string, so a binary sequence, or so a real number, it meets the the set, the dense set, if there exists an initial segment of it which belongs uh, which belongs to the dense set. And so a real is weakly one generic if it meets every sigma zero one dense set, so every CE uh, dense set of strings. And so how do we build uh, weakly one generic sets? naively the approach would be the following we first list, list all the uh, ce sets and now we want to uh, to to build a weekly one generic set uh, thanks to uh, the finite extension method so we we make longer and longer initial segments of the of the the set that we want to build and uh, at so at some stage sigma s we want to to intersect or to meet uh, WS, or the, the or at least the least um, unsatisfied uh, sets, uh, by asking, uh, can I find can I find an extension in my set? And of course, this question is not computable. But so we can try to parameterize the construction by having a function which will be a time function, and we ask uh, if we wait for the time uh, f of uh, S will uh, will an extension of my my sigma S appear uh, in uh, in W i and if so then I try to satisfy W i by taking this extension and if not then I just continue my construction so of course this is a very uh, so so the the actual construction is slightly more subtle than that but what codes prove is that uh, if you are given a weekly one generic uh, real 
if you look at the principal function of it, so that is the, the function which to n associates the n elements of this, uh, of this set, then this provides you a function which will make this construction work. And so actually the, 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 the thing to, to conclude is that uh, this construction is without loss of generality in the sense that the resulting object carries its own construction. So not only the construction is natural, so it's something we could naively try to do. So we'd want to satisfy one after the others by the finite extension method, but also we don't lose in generality because whatever property we are able to, uh, whatever property is true about the weekly one generic set, we would be able to produce uh, something having this property thanks to this constru construction. So I want to apply this kind of intuition to, uh, to reverse mathematics. And so first of all, let's say that uh, a lot of mathematical theorems uh, can be interpreted as mathematical problems in terms of uh, instances and solutions. For example, if you take the intermediate value theorem, so it tells you that for every continuous function, which uh, changes its sign over an interval, then there exists a real number, so that uh, which is a zero for the function. And so we can see it as a problem where an instance is a continuous function and a solution is a real for which uh, you are equal to zero. Another example is Koenig's lemma, which tells you that for every infinite finite branching tree, you have an infinite path trait. And so of course, this, these two problems, so don't talk about uh, integers and sets of integers, but you can always represent them uh, in a reasonable way uh, code them as sets of integers. And so if you look at the proofs, uh, the intermediate value theorem gives you a way to uh, describe the zero of the function. So by, you have a dichotomy, you have the, uh, yeah, you can, you can just use the trichotomy uh, uh, algorithm and then you will find, you will find a, a description of, of the zero. And so in particular, this is a computably true statement in the sense that given a computable continuous function, then you will be able to find a computable real. So for Koenig's lemma, it's, uh, it's more subtle because when you look at the proof, so it's very simple, you start from the roots and because you are finally branching tree, one of the immediate children must have an infinite subtree below it. And so you take one of it and you iterate the process. So this sounds uh, constructive, but it's not computable in the sense that you have to decide at every level uh, whether a branch is infinite or not, and this is something you cannot do computably. And so in particular, there exists some infinite uh, computable binary trees, which have no infinite computable path. So uh, one of the goals of reverse mathematics is to, uh, to be able to compare the strength of, of uh, various mathematical problems and there are multiple frameworks for that. So one of the, uh, the, the historical framework is the one of reverse mathematics, which is in terms of subsystems of second order arithmetic, where we express everything in the language of uh, so second order arithmetic. So in terms of uh, integers and sets of integers, and uh, we work over a, a very base, uh, basic uh, system, a very weak system, which is called RCN knots, and which captures informally the computable mathematics. And so, we can ask over RC and not, does one, math, one statement implies another statement or not? Here we are going to use, uh, because it will be a really, um, uh, yeah, a study case, we, we are going to use a much simpler uh, framework, which is called the computable reduction. So the idea is, uh, is very simple. So a problem P is computable, re computably reducible to a problem Q if, Informally, if we were having a Q solver, we would be able to construct a P solver in the following sense. Uh, given an instance of P, we can computably transform it into an instance of Q and feed it to the Q solver. And then given a solution to the Q solver and the original instance from P, we are going to again transform it into a solution to uh, the instance of P. So it's exactly what is written below. So every P instance computes a Q instance, so that for every solution, you recompute a solution to the original instance with the help of uh, the original instance. Okay. 
And so when we try to prove a non-reduction, so that P is not computably reducible to Q, so what we usually do is we first construct a computable instance of P, which has only complex solutions. And then we prove that for every computable instance of Q, there exists a simple solution. And by simple, it means that does not compute any of the complex solutions. And usually, so the, the way to build a, a solution to the instance of Q is to use a notion of forcing. And uh, by a purely empirical observation on uh, the reverse mathematical practice, the notion of forcing to build a solution to Q usually does not depend on P. So that's not a theorem at all, it's just an observation. So, and it means that somehow Q seems to have a canonical notion of forcing, canonical in the sense that when you want to separate Q from P without loss of generality, you will you, you know which notion of forcing you are going to use for Q. It will always be the same. And so can we make uh, this, in, this intuition formal? And can we can we define a framework for that? So let's just exemplify a little bit uh, this observation. For example, for weak Unix lemma, there seems to be the forcing with Python one classes or equivalently the forcing with computable infinite binary trees. So the, the, the forcing conditions are computable binary trees and, and you are partially ordered by, by the subset relation. And so when we when we make separation, we we always use the same notion of forcing. Same for, for ADS. So ADS. Uh, it so okay. Let me maybe restate. So WKL is the statement uh, for every infinite binary tree that exists an infinite path through it. ADS is a statement for every uh, infinite linear order that exists an infinite uh, increasing sequence of an infinite decreasing sequence. And so, for proving that a statement is not reducible to ADS, we usually uh, have the same notion of forcing, which is called the forcing with split pairs. I mean, there is no proper name for it, but, and and so all the, the separations are, are proved with the same notion of forcing. And for D and C functions, so diagonally non computable functions, there is this notion of forcing, which is forcing with bushy trees. And all the separation proofs with D and C are, uh, are variations of, of this notion of forcing. So is there a way, uh, a formal way of saying that forcing with Python one classes is the canonical notion of forcing for weakening lemma and so on for ADS and DNC? So let's try to design a framework for this. So first of all, a weakness property is just a, a class of sets or, or, or binary sequences, uh, which is downward closed under the Turing reducibility. So which is, quite natural. So if something is weak, then everything computable by, by this weak set is again weak. And we say that a problem P, so a problem is really formulated in terms of instances and solutions, computably satisfies a weakness property if for every computable instance uh, of P, you have a solution which, which is weak, basically. Belongs to W just means that you are weak. So an example of a weakness property is uh, pick a non-computable set A then, if you look at all the set X which do not compute A, this is a weakness property. And in particular, weakening lemma, so the statement about uh, infinite binary trees, uh, computably satisfies uh, uh, this weakness property for every set A. So this weakness property is parameterized by A, and for every A which is not computable, you computably satisfy it. And so, the thing is, if a problem Q computably satisfies a weakness property, but P does not, then P is not computably reducible to Q. So this is very basic. Just unfolding the definition is clear that it's the case. So now let's talk about notion of forcing and, and try to define the notion of canonical uh, notion of forcing. So given a problem P, we say that a P forcing it's just a, a family of notion of forcing, which is parameterized by your by your instance. So so it's a family of notion of forcing, so that for every instance of your problem, uh, 
if you consider the associated notion of our thing, every sufficiently generic filter will yield a solution to uh, your instance. So for now, I'm staying very uh, abstract and, and we not go deeply into uh, what actually uh, this means. And we say that a, a P forcing computably satisfies the witness property. So if for every computable instance of your problem, then every sufficiently generic filter will yield a weak, so something belonging to, to your witness property. Okay. And so uh, still taking the example of a free Koenig lemma, if you look at the forcing with Spider-1 classes, it computably satisfies a WA for every uh, non-computable set A. So that is, it's just the, the, the con avoidance basic theorem. It tells you if you have a, so if you have a non-computable uh, set A, then for every uh, computable binary tree, you can find an infinite path, which still does not compute A. And that can be proven with the help of forcing with path one classes. So now, the question is, what class of weakness properties uh, can we, uh, should we consider? Because of course we cannot ask, so it would be too strong to say, oh, it, it can it call for all the pro weakness properties? So a, a, a notion of force, or a, P, a notion of P forcing is canonical for a class of weakness properties. If for every weakness property belonging to this class, uh, whenever the problem computably satisfies this weakness property, then so does the notion of forcing. So it doesn't mean that uh, P has to, so if if the notion of forcing is canonical for this class, it doesn't mean that it's going to, to computably satisfy every notion in this class, but it's just uh, whenever a property can be proven about the object we consider, then this notion of forcing can be used to show uh, that this is true. But so what is the right notion to consider? And so now we want to be very pragmatic. We want to look at the notion of forcing which are used actually in reverse mathematics for proving separation. And we can classify these notions into uh, two big families first, the effectiveness properties and the genericity properties. So effectiveness properties are the properties which require somehow some kind of effectivity in the construction. So it just means that you have to be either, you have to use either a computable construction or it has to be computable in some, some oracle and so on. So for example, you can ask, uh, you can consider the, the, the weakness property of the low sets. So the set X so that, which have the same Turing jump as the, the halting set. Or we can look at the weakness property of being arithmetical. So the set of all the arithmetic sets is a weakness property. On the other hand, there are the generic properties, which are usually obtained by uh, every sufficiently generic uh, filter for notion of forcing. And so among these, we have con avoidance. So given a non-computable set A, consider the, the class of X's which do not compute A, but you also have the notion of preservation of hyperimmunity. So a function is hyperimmune if it's not dominated by any computable function. So it has to for, for, to grow very fast at, at some points at, uh, for infinite many values. It has to be very large for infinite many values. And so given some hyperimmune function, we can look at the set of X's so that, that you are still X hyperimmune, which means that even if you are able to, to, to use the Oracle X, you are still not able to compute a function which will dominate F. So we preserve the hyperimmunity of F. And you also have, for example, preservation of non sigma zero one definitions. So we say that if you have a set A which is not definable by sigma zero one formula, you can look at the collection of all Xs so that A is still not definable by a sigma zero one formula with X as a parameter, which means that X will not simplify the definition of A. And by, again, an empirical observation, if we look at uh, the, the, the separation which are proven in reverse mathematics, so I don't know any separation which cannot be proven by a generosity property. So we can just forget about effectiveness properties. It's sufficient to, to consider generosity properties. But 
still, even within the genericity properties, a, a very a useful and natural subclass is uh, about closed set avoidance. So a closed set avoidance property is a property of this form. So given a closed set in the bare space, so which is just, in other words, the, the set of infinite path. So the class of infinite path through a, a, an infinite branching uh, tree, infinitely branching tree. Um, so if C has no computable number, we can look at the set of X's so that C has still no X computable number. So in other words, X does not compute. Yeah, well, just is what it is. And so we can rephrase many uh, genericity properties in terms of closed set avoidance properties. For example, uh, the con avoidance is just you want to avoid the singleton A for a non computable set A. Preservation of hyperminity, you just given a hypermin function, you look at the, the closed set of all the functions which dominate F. It's again a closed set in the best space. And so you 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 preserve the property finally if you avoid uh, computing a member of CF. And for example, again, being of non-DNC degree is just the class of functions so that for some n you you fail to be DNC, and this is again a close uh, a close set in the bare space. So uh, I claim that uh, for almost all the statements and there are good reasons for why it fell for some other statements, it's sufficient to restrict yourself to closed set uh, avoidance properties. And hey, Zubik, so, Zubik, can, yes. can you go back to the previous slide? The last yes. condition that they seem to define a closed set, right? It's open rather. Uh, uh, non density degree, so it's entered. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's not a closed set. Okay, no, sure, sure. So let's forget about the last one. Uh, actually, um, so it's not a closed set, uh, but the okay, the framework uh, actually, when we restrict ourselves to closed set avoidance, it's actually equivalent to uh, consider uh, sigma two set. So sigma two uh, classes are not only uh, closed set. So, but okay, let's let's forget about the last slide. Sigma two definitely okay. So let's yes. open a yes. sigma two, but yes, but but you're right. It's, it was not closed. Okay, so one way of better understanding a statement is uh, usually looking at uh, some kind of projection of this statement. And for example, in reverse mathematics, to better understand uh, theorems, we look at their first order part, which is the set of statements which which are purely uh, arithmetical, so which uh, don't talk about sets of integers and which are provable by your statement. So it's called the first order part of your problem. And in the VIAR degrees, there is also a notion of first order part, which is just the the problems which whose uh, whose image uh, is an, so are integers and which are consequences of of your problem. And the way I see uh, the study of of the closed set of avoidance properties is what I would call the first jump part of a problem. So is looking at the closed sets for which you, you that you are able to to computably avoid. So, or in other words, that you computably satisfy the associated weakness property. And this really somehow characterizes what uh, Sholak Jokesh and Slaman call the, the, the first jump control of, of a problem. So, but let's let's look at some examples and, and see uh, how we can apply this framework. So it has been a lot of definitions and let's look at, at practical examples. And let's look first at trivial examples. There are some notions of forcing which are very weak in the sense that as soon as a closed set in the bare space has no computable member, then this notion of forcing would produce something which still does not compute any member of this closed set. So in other words, it preserves all the weakness properties which uh, of, of this class. And this is the case of, of Cohen forcing. So if you have a closed set with no computable member, then for every sufficiently Cohen generic, uh, you, you will obtain something which still does not compute any member of this closed set. 
And so it's pretty easy to see. Um, so given a, a Turing functional of phi E and a Cohen condition, so we can ask, can I find an extension so that I will force, uh, so assuming that we force totality of phi E, that it means that whatever the extension uh, tau of sigma, there will be again an extension of it for which I will halt or more and more values of phi E. And so either I'm able to find to, to find an extension for which I will halt and and leave the closed set, and then I will have forced not to compute a member of the closed set, or I will be able to define a computable procedure to compute a, a member of the closed set by by just looking at longer and longer uh, segments for which uh, I produ phi e produces some outputs. And since I failed to to halt on the wrong value, then it will each time I halt, I will I will yield more and more information about the path, and 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 then this would contradict the hypothesis that uh, C had no computable member. So I'm very hand waving here, but uh, the proof is very simple. And so there are some statements in various mathematics which are consequences of of uh, Cohen genericity. For example, the atomic model theorem. So if you are sufficiently generic for Cohen uh, for Cohen uh, forcing, you are going to build solution to the atomic model theorem. And so in particular. Uh, it means that uh, the atomic model theorem is going to preserve any uh, any closed set avoidance uh, weakness property. So it's very weak. So somehow it's a dummy example because since it's below somehow the scope of this framework, um, by this definition, co-enforcing is a canonical notion for this. But uh, yeah, it's not very satisfactory. Another uh, less trivial example is is uh, cohesiveness. So, if uh, you have a closed set which has no computable member, so in the still closed set in a bare space, if you fix any set A, whatever the the computational power of A, you will always be able to find a set G which does not compute any member of C, but whose germ computes A. So somehow we can always find a, a, a set relative to which A will become delta 2, while still maintaining the property that C has no computable member. And in particular, uh, this shows that cohesiveness and highness admit, so, so are going to preserve all these uh, weakness properties. So here again, cohesiveness is trivial from the viewpoint of first jump control and but there are some good reasons for that it's because cohesiveness is really about the second jump okay let's let's start to look at non-trivial examples because for now we have been only considering problems for which um which were preserving everything so so we want so of course if we have a notion of forcing which preserves everything and a statement which preserves everything they are going to to coincide and so it will be uh, vacuously uh, the canonical notion of forcing for it but for no good reason so here if we look at weak Koenig's lemma there are some closed sets with no computable members and instances of weak Koenig's lemma uh, so that every solution to weak Koenig's lemma is going to compute a member of the closed set basically uh, most stupid example if you take the closed set of all completions of piano arithmetic so it's a closed set, it's even an effectively closed set, and uh, weakening lemma does not computably preserve uh, this closed set. So there are some properties for which uh, that you don't preserve. But still, uh, weakening lemma, uh, lemma does computably preserve WA, when, so the, 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 the cone which does not compute, uh, so, so still preserves the WA, which is a set of X's which does not compute A. So there are some properties that it preserves, some properties that it doesn't. So it's not a trivial example. And uh, actually, we can prove that uh, the notion of forcing with uh, Python 1 classes is canonical for the closed set avoidance properties. So how, how to see that? So we work with non-empty Python 1 classes. So a condition is, so first of all, we fix a closed set which has no computable number. And we have a condition, which is a Python class. 
And we want to show that the, 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 the set of phi one classes which force um, phi eg not to belong to C is dense. And we want to show that if it fails, so if we, we can prove it for every E, then we win, because then we have shown that we can preserve this uh, closed set of a property. But if it fails, we have to show that weakening lemma does not computably preserve WC. So you have your closed set that you want to avoid, and you have D, which is a non-empty phase one class, which is a condition of your forcing, and phi E, and you want to show that uh, you want to find an extension which will force phi E uh, not to be a member of C. So one way to make, to make it succeed is to find a sigma, so a finite string, so uh, an initial sigma of a member of D for which you halt and you, you escape, you, you are going to leave the closed set. If you are able to find, so, so in other words, some extendable node in the tree representing a D, then you, you succeed. You, you have found an, uh, an extension which is going to, to make you avoid computing a member of C. Another way to succeed is to restrict to a sub Python class of, um, of the X so that you, you do not act on some fixed input N. If for some N you are going, this class is non-empty, then this is an extension which force you to, to be partial and so you win a game. If you fail uh, with these two conditions, then it means that, uh, so phi, so of X, so the image of, of the path, so the, of the member of, okay, let's see, the image of this functional uh, by the, the member of D is an effectively compact subset of C. And actually it's known that every effectively, so every PA degree computes a member of uh, every effectively compact uh, set. So effectively compact just means that um, it means that you you can be represented by a computable finitely branching tree for which you at every node you know exactly computably what are the immediate successors of of this node. So you have perfect information on the tree. And so here, uh, it shows that either you succeed in, in proving the density, or actually we can create an instance of weakness gamma so that every solution is going to compute a number to C. And so this yields uh, a characterization of the properties that weakness gamma preserves. It preserves a closed set avoidance property if and only if the closed set has no non-empty effectively compact subset. And so that's um, one of the side effects of proving the existence of uh, a canonical notion of forcing for weakness lemma is that now we obtain a forcing free characterization of, the, of, of these properties. And so for example, we can reobtain cone avoidance just by looking at uh, C to be, uh, so cone avoidance is when you have a non covariant set A, you look at, the closed set, which is the singleton A. And A, this closed set has no non-empty effectively compact subset because otherwise it would mean that the singleton A is a singleton pi the one class. And then A would be computable. So we, for free, we obtain uh, convergence, but we also obtain preservation of hyperimmunity. So because given a hyperimmune uh, function C, uh, F, if you look at the closed set of all the G which dominate F, it cannot have any non-empty effectively compact subset because otherwise look, looking at the function witnessing that you are effectively compact, so the function which dominates the branching of the function uh, of the tree, uh, this function would dominate F. And so it would, it would contradict the hyperimmunity of, of F. So here again, thanks to, to this theorem, uh, without notion of forcing, we are able to show that uh, you preserve hyperimmunity. But for example, for, for DNC, the, the Python one class of the one value DNC function has, is actually a non-empty effectively compact uh, set. 
And so it's not completely preserved by, uh, by Wikunix lemma. So consequences, so there are two consequences of proving canonicity of, of a notion of parsing. The first is that it gives a forcing free criterion of preservation. So once for all, actually, by proving this theorem, so uh, once for all, we, we prove this theorem by forcing, okay? But once we have proven it, we can apply it to all these uh, preservation notions without to redefine, without having to redefine the notion of forcing. And, and while the, the, the forcing um, mechanism is, is quite verbose and, and there are a lot of technical lemmas, and so it helps us uh, concentrate on the, the core combinatorial theorem. And another consequence is that it yields a uniform procedure. It means that actually, if Wikimedia does not completely preserve a closed set avoidance property, then there exists an instance of weakness lemma, but also there exists a unique uh, functional so that every solution to to this instance, so every path through this instance of weakness lemma, uh, while feeding it to the functional, would produce a, a path through uh, the closed set, a member of the closed set. So it gives us some uniformity. Let's just take another uh, non-trivial example, which is for the ascending descending sequence. And for simplicity, I'm going to restrict myself to um, uh, linear orders of type omega plus omega star. So which means you have a copy of the integers and then you have a, a reverse copy of the integers. So you have given a, an instance of SLES let's call uh, u the omega part of it and u star the omega uh, v the uh, omega star part so the forcing conditions are um, pairs sigma 0 and sigma 1 so pairs of of uh, of integers so that sigma 0 and sigma 1 are both uh, increasing in terms of as integers and sigma 0 is uh, increasing uh, from the point of view of, of the linear order, and sigma one is decreasing from the point of view of li the linear order. But also we want both sides to be extendable. And by being extendable, we want that all the elements of sigma zero must be in the omega part of the linear order. And all the elements of sigma one have to be in the omega star part. Because of course, if you have some element of sigma zero, which belongs to the omega star part, you are not going to be able to extend it to an infinite solution. So we always want to stay, so sigma zero wants to stay on the, the left part of the divide line and, and sigma one on the right part. And this notion of forcing uh, is canonical for, uh, for closed set avoidance properties. So for, for SADS. So here, uh, the proof is uh, slightly different because we are first, we are building two, two objects. We are building an ascending sequence and we are building a descending sequence. And we don't, have, we don't know ahead of time uh, what will be the, the, the desired solution. So at the end, one of the two will succeed. So we, we are going to, to show some disjunctive requirements. So given a closed set and two functionals, we want to show that the set of conditions which force either the left part to succeed for this functional or the right part to succeed for this functional is dense. And if you are able to show it for every pair of functional, then at the end, it means that for one side, it will succeed for every functional and, and we win. It's the standard pairing argument. And so we want that if we fail to show that uh, it is dense, then we want to construct an instance of SADS which does not completely preserve the property. And for this, we are going to use the notion of split pair. A split pair, it really looks like a condition. So you have a, a two, uh, it's a pair of strings. So both are ascending from the point of view of the integers and tau zero is ascending from the point of view of the linear order and tau one is descending from the point of view of the linear order. Except that we don't require tau zero to be in the omega part and tau one to be in the omega star part. What we require is that the, the maximum element from the point of view of the linear order in to zero is smaller than the minimum element uh, of to one. 
And this ensures that uh, if to zero uh, overlaps, overlapses in the sense that it has an element which belongs to the omega star part, then to one is fully included in the omega star part. And on the other way, if to one is a is a wrong uh, wrong thing from in the sense that it's not fully included in the omega star part, then to zero is good. So um, this is really the difference between a, a condition. So a condition both have to be good, both have to be extendable, but it's harder to describe because we have to we require that sigma zero is included in u and sigma one is included in v, and this is a delta two uh, property. On the other hand, this is can be described purely computably, and so but uh, with the disadvantage that we only know that one of the two would, will be good. So, how how goes the argument? You have a closed set, you have a condition, and we have a pair of functionals, and we want to find an extension of this condition, which will force uh, one of the two conditions to either be partial or to escape or to, to leave the closed set somehow. So the argument is, is basically the same as for, uh, for Wikileaks lemma. So if on the left, there exists a two zero, so we can extend the left part. So that is still a condition. And when you feed the left functional with the left part, you escape the closed set, then you succeed. You take a two zero sigma one as the extension and you forced to halt on the wrong value somehow. You have the symmetric argument. So if on the right, you can find an extension so that it's still a condition and I force the right functional to escape the closed set, then again, I win. The third part is for forcing partiality. If there is some N so that there is no split pair uh, extending the condition, uh, so that uh, I can make uh, both functional uh, be defined on, 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 on the initial sigma of length n. Then here again, I win because then I claim that I force, uh, I force uh, the one of the two functionals to be partial. Because if it's the case, suppose for the contradiction that both functionals were total, it means that in particular, Taking, uh, so we have G0 and G1, which are the, the objects that we obtain by the notion of forcing, then it means that there would be an initial segment of, of, uh, of G0 and an initial segment of G1 for which you would be defined on, on 0 to the n. And this would form a split pair contradicting uh, the failure of this. So here again, it's, it's always a complicated complicated to see a, a proof through a talk, but the argument is very simple. But so what if we fail to find an extension which, which forces uh, which forces a phi zero or phi one to, to escape the closed set? Then it means that by failure of the third part, for every n, we are going to find split pairs which, uh, which uh, ask for phi, for the left and the right functional to provide longer and longer initial segments of the closed set. And because um, and because we we have the negation of the two first points, whenever so in a split pair, if to zero is a valid side, then what outputs the left functional has to be. Uh, an initial segment of a member of the closed set, and if the right part is valid, then it has to be also it has to be also uh, uh, an initial segment of a member of the closed set. So what we can do is we can computably enumerate split pairs, which will ask for the two functionals to output more and more initial segments of of what they claim to be a member of the closed set. And but of course, for each of these split pair one of the two sides might be uh, wrong, but we don't know computably which one is wrong. But uh, if you take the max, for example, of uh, the maximum element of the left part of these split pairs, uh, this 
these elements are still ordered by your instance of SADS, and this is a, a computable subinstance of SADS. And if you are given an ascending sequence, this is a, a subset of the omega part. And if you are given a, a descending sequence, this is a subset of the omega star part. And so any solution to this subinstance of SADS will be able to tell you which side of these split pairs is the valid side. And thanks to this, you are going to be able to compute a member of the closed set. So here again, we, you will need to, to, to sit and think about this, but the argument is very simple. So here again, uh, SADS uh, has a canonical notion of forcing. And so in other words, if you want to show that, SAD, uh, that SADS does not prove another statement uh, using a uh, if you want to show that it satisfies some weakness property which can be expressed in terms of closed set, without loss of generality, you can use this notion of forcing. This is what we can deduce. Uh, I think I won't have too much time to talk about second jump parts. What I say is um, for cohesiveness, so we can we can define the uh, closed set jump avalanche property by saying. Uh, Given a, a closed set which has no zero prime computable member, I look at the set of X's which sees whose jump still does not compute a member of the closed set in bare space. And actually, so co, so cohesiveness which was trivial for the first jump control is non trivial for the second jump control. And we can actually uh, design a notion of forcing for cohesiveness. Now I'm going very fast because uh, it's quite technical and, and we are running out of time. So, Cohesiveness has a notion of forcing which is canonical for, for the second jump control somehow. Okay, so I will end up with uh, a question is about DNC function. So for DNC function, so function is DNC if for every E, uh, it would tell you a value which is different from phi of E. There exists a standard notion of forcing for, for building solutions, uh, for building DNC functions. It's what we call bushy trees uh, forcing. So a tree is uh, k bushy above a string if uh, at every, uh, so if basically it started with, uh, as, as a stem, it has sigma, and then at every level, you have at least uh, k immediate children. So it's it's very bushy, uh, how it goes. And the set B is k small if there is no, so k small above uh, a stem, if there is no k bushy tree, uh, finite k bushy tree, all of the leaves belonging to B. So somehow, if a set is k small, it, it's not very large in the sense that uh, if you have uh, sufficiently many elements, you are going to avoid this set. And so the bushy tree forcing is, is a notion where you have pairs, where you have stem sigma, which is basically the initial segment of the DNC function that you are going to build, and a bad set, which is usually a CE set of bad elements, which is k small above sigma. And so the question is, is this notion canonical for closed set uh, avalanche property? And somehow there are some intuition which says it has to be canonical. It's because Computing a DNC function is the same as being able to escape a CE set for which you can bound the size of CE set. So it's it's the so and it's exactly what we need. It should since this is what we need for bushy tree forcing because we want to avoid the bad set. And when you have a B, which is a case small CE set, then when we want to extend sigma to still avoid B. The set of n so that b is not k small above sigma n is a CE set of size at most k minus one. So we can bound the size. So DNC function is able to construct uh, an infinite an infinite sequence of conditions uh, for bushy tree forcing. But still, uh, this is not enough to prove that it's canonical. So it's still uh, the, the question I have is. Uh, does this notion produce some kind of degenerate DNC functions, or uh, is it canonical for for DNC functions? Okay, this is the end of my talk. I'm sorry if had, if it has been a bit too fast or technical. So, do you have any question? Uh, 
Right, thanks, uh, Ludovic, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, very general ideas, I think. Are there any questions? So the sound is cut. I can't hear you anymore. Okay, do you hear me? I hear you, yes. Okay, are there any questions? Or comments. So this open problem you mentioned, you have a good candidate for this forcing notion you are looking for. Just you don't know, you, you are not able to prove yet, let's say, that it's the right one. Are there also cases where you are you have really no good candidate yet? I mean, or... so so basically the the always what we want to reach is to have uh, the, the best notion of forcing for RMCC rep, for example. So for RMCC rep for pairs, uh, what is the the right notion of forcing? Uh, so that's whatever property we want to prove about RMCC rep for pairs, we are able to prove it with this notion of forcing. And so for cohesiveness, for example, we have achieved this. And But for SRT22, so or D22, or for the pigeonhole principle, uh, this is basically something for which um, uh, we almost have it. So we have we have notion of forcing which are very precise and, and are able to to control iterated jumps and so on. But it's still unknown, for example, whether uh, yeah, there are still some questions we are not able to answer about um, about the pigeonhole principle and. The question is, is it because uh, the answer is no, or is it because uh, we have not found the, 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 the right notion of forcing? So when, when we are not able to show that uh, the pigeonhole principle um, preserves a weakness property, does it show that actually it does not preserve it? So, so or uh, is there, an, or does it means that there exists another notion of forcing which would be able to force it, but but we don't know it yet. I see. Other questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Ludovic again.